trying to figure out if I'm supposed to change game plan. Just give me a minute. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, no, nah, I think we'll just jump in. Um, the Lord does have some things to say today. My only prayer is that he's about to use my mouth for it. <laughs> um, Psalm 90 verse 12 has been our kind of starting verse for this whole series. It's the verse the Lord used to kind of get me on the track that we're on, the kingdom invitation. And I'm just going to read verse 12 again. Um, and I'm reading from the Passion translations here it says help us to remember that our days are numbered and help us to interpret our lives correctly you know we need to interpret our lives correctly and you know that there's an uh, there is an elaborate um world system the kingdom of this world that has been built it's all false it's all fake but it's been built to cause us to not interpret our lives correctly to hinder a correct interpretation of life. Um, you know, one of the things I believe as I was praying this week, one of the things I believe that's happening in the world right now, and I think this is always happening, but I think it's like exponential right now in the spiritual realm and the physical realm, is the, the distinction or the division between the kingdom of this world, the enemy's kingdom, and the kingdom of God is is growing apart. And I think we've lived in times, um, especially in recent history in this country, where you could, you could kind of straddle the, the chasm between the two and it would kind of work out. You could have some kingdom. You could have some, some of the Lord in your life, some of the kingdom here where you like it, and you could kind of straddle and have some of the world and be living over here where you like it. But I think it's becoming a Grand Canyon where there's, no, there's not going to be any straddling. The distinction between the... You just watch what's going on, and the distinction between the two is just ripping apart like a chasm. Um, <laughs> uh, what I'm going to do... You know, I'm going to start by answering some questions, okay? And I'm going to start with one. During this series, I get various questions based on what we're teaching where people say, well, yeah, but what about, you're saying this, but what about this? Okay. And one of them pertains to, we've taught about um, in recent weeks, and actually I think this question, well, in recent weeks, that the kingdom of God is, is received as a child, right? From Jesus' own words. Okay. I want to read two of those scriptures, and it's going to lead us to the question that I get and it's so important. Okay, so I'm starting in Mark 10 and verse 13. Okay, here it says, Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Now, here it is. Verse 15 says, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Will by no means enter it. Do you see there's two words? There's receive and enter. Okay? And this scripture. Now, I'm going to read another one. Matthew 18, verse, starting verse 2, is another place Jesus talks about how we receive or enter the kingdom. Here it says, Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted... Now, let me tell you what that name means. It means turn around, reverse. It comes from a root word that means revolution. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Unless you have a revolution, what kind of a revolution? And become as little children, that kind, you will by no means enter. See that word again? Receive and enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The children are the greatest. You talk about an upside down kingdom. But now listen, here's what I've got to tell you. This is what we do, and this is, this is going to lead us where we're going. Um, 
Well, let me do this. Um, actually, I want to I tell you the question. It'll be better this way. I want to tell you the question, and I want to read the verse that the question comes from. People say, well, what about the verse where it talks about seizing or taking with violence, with force, the kingdom of God, right? So let's read this. Matthew eleven eleven says, Assuredly, I say to you, this is Jesus speaking again, Among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Do you know what's going on here? I'm going to show you another scripture in a minute just like it. But, the, but Jesus, in his own words, is drawing a dividing line in history. Okay? Why is John the Baptist the greatest? And all the prophets before were not even like that. Because he was the one who finished up the prophecy of a certain time. Do you know none of the Old Testament passes away? But on the other hand, the, the addition, the change in covenant that Jesus brings changes everything. Okay? And, and so, but then it goes on to say, um, goes on to say, uh, verse 12, thank you. Um, he, actually 11, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Why? Because now you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes, that's the change from John the Baptist. It's an utter and complete difference in the nature of reality. Okay, that you are the temple. You carry the Holy Spirit within yourself. That's greater than John the Baptist. Okay, but here's why we're reading this. Now it says, verse 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now... The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take, which means seize or pull pull by force. The violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears, let him hear. That's what Jesus says. So which is it? Is the kingdom received as a child? Is it entered as a child? Or is it something that is, that is taken by force with a certain violence? And the answer is yes. But look, there's an insight here, okay? <clears throat> and, and this is what we need to talk about for just a minute. Um, the, The difference is in the receiving and the entering, okay? Receiving and entry is the gate to the kingdom. Doing okay so far? Okay, we're about to read in a minute that that's narrow, okay? But let me tell you what we get wrong. We think when we read these scriptures that talk about the narrow gate that it means it's a narrow kingdom. (laughs) It's not. The gate is narrow. Why is the gate narrow? Because there's one way. One name, Jesus, okay? That's why the gate is narrow. That's why we enter as like a child, with the humility of a child, with the wonder of a child, a simple faith that you can't explain like a child because the gate is narrow. The gate is Jesus and Jesus only. That's the only way you receive it. It's the only way you enter. Good so far? But now let me tell you what we do, and I'm going to read a scripture um, that causes us to do it in a minute, because I want you to know where you got this thought from. The idea is, is that the gate is narrow, and so then we think the kingdom is narrow. That once I get through the gate, now it's a narrow road. Are you following me? Now I got to stay on this road. Okay, I got through the gate, and now I've, it's a performance kingdom. I've got to behave well. I've got to do all these things in order to stay on God's good side. In order to stay on the path, this is a really narrow kingdom, okay? Because the gate was narrow. Because the gate was only Jesus. Okay, but now watch this. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to prove it in the Word of God. The kingdom of God is a great wide place. (laughs) <laughs> it is that the gate is narrow. There is only one way. And the word of God says that wide is the gate to take all kinds of world options. You follow me? But the gate to receive, to enter the kingdom is narrow. Jesus and Jesus only is the gate. But once you get through that gate, you see the enemy, and I'm going to prove it in the Word of God, the enemy wants us to get into a mode where we sit in the gate for the rest of our lives. 
<laughs> and that is not the plan of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is an enterprising place. It's a creative place where the Holy Spirit of God releases identities that are as diverse as every person who's a son or daughter of God. And there are great works and callings to be done in this kingdom. It's a great big wide place. It's not a place where God's standing on the side of the path ready to smack you if you step off. <laughs> okay? The gate is narrow, though. And so doesn't it lead to the question, and we're going to get here too, I just want to throw it out there. What is the violence? I mean, I know you, there's, we're tempted to just say, okay, well, it's a very great warfare over this kingdom, right? And that would be true. And that certainly is part of it. But is that the violence? If we leave it there, we really don't put our finger on the violence, the force that pulls the kingdom of God into our experience, the blessings. You know, there's a psalm that says, forget not all of his benefits. What does that mean? It means forget not all of his benefits. We're citizens of a great big kingdom that is full of benefits. Not that we praise or worship him for the benefits, but he's that kind of a father. <laughs> and Jesus is that kind of a king, you understand? And the Holy Spirit is that kind of a person who wants to deliver all the benefits to the sons and daughters of God. So we're going we're gonna to talk about all those things. Um, I think we should go ahead and read this scripture, Matthew 7, verse 13 says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Now, I want you to see something. I'm going to read on, so stay right there, but I want you to see that what the warfare is. We're going to talk a little bit about warfare, because I'm hearing what's going on in your families, and I know the kind of attack that's been coming against mine lately. Okay, so we're going to begin to talk. Part of the kingdom invitation is to victory. Do you know that? It's, it's the invitation to live in victory. And yet there's a lot of adversity, right? We're going to talk about that. That doesn't mean you exit victory, though. You, you know, I have to do this, too. The Word of God is really a spoiler, isn't it? Imagine this. <laughs> Imagine if you went to... Um, the, I like hockey, so I'm going to go hockey, okay? You go to the final game of the Stanley Cup, and you sit down, and you hear the announcer go, you know, welcome, welcome to Coors Stadium for the final game of the series where we're going to watch the avalanche take the cup 5-3 to three today. And can you imagine? The Word of God is like that. The Word of God is a spoiler. I dare you to read the end of the story. <laughs> Okay, he wanted you to know and stand in the assurance that the victory's not up in the air. Even in adversity, right? And I'm going to talk about, we're, we're going to get a handle on that today. We just need to. We need to get a handle on how, how adversity works in our life and even more who it comes from. <laughs> okay, we get very confused ideas that are never presented in the Word of God and do hinder our ability to spread our wings in the great, big, wide kingdom. Okay? I don't know why I went there because we're reading about the narrow gate um, and, and wide is the way to destruction. This is what I wanted to say. Do you know that the, in the warfare there's only one battle? It's the battle between life and death. And it, it operates around all of us as we are disciples of Jesus. Do you know that? There are things in your life that, that are even after you come to Jesus, there are things in your life that lead to death. And he's in the process of rooting it out. There are things in your life that, that are of Jesus, and, so, and he is life, and so therefore they're leading to life in you. Verse 14 says, Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, that's true, but we've got to break out of the, the error of mindset that once you're in the gate, <laughs> it's not a, a, um, a kingdom of freedom and grace, creativity, <laughs> and activity, 
joyful participation in the Spirit, things you've never seen before, things you've never heard of that He has planned for you. We spend a lot of time sitting in the gate. Some of what we're talking about, I'm just going to hit this one quickly. Luke 16, verse 13. Okay, because we're talking about this the whole time. No servant can serve two masters. That's trying to straddle the canyon, right? While it's splitting apart. Eventually you're going to fall in. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I want you to know, um, for time's sake we're not, but if we read on, actually, yes, we are. Skip to verse 16. We just have to do this because it shows that we're tying all of this are truths in the Word of God that, that are meant to be tied together, that are meant to be understood as a picture. Here in verse 16, it says, The law and the prophets were until John. Sound familiar? Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Do you hear that word, pressing? So what, what is that? I thought you receive it as a child. I thought it was just great humility and wonder and simplicity. But this is talking, you see, which is, which is right? Yes, both. Once you're through the gate, there is a pressing. It is violent people that have a fire and a passion that say, I'm getting everything God has for me. Pressing. And it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. Okay. Is it a narrow kingdom or a wide kingdom? <laughs> Performance or freedom? Freedom. freedom. <laughs> you know, even the gate is not a performance, okay? You're not drawn to the gate and you don't walk through it on your own anyway. Oh, yes, you have to agree. <laughs> I'll give you that. After he takes you by the hand and walks you to the gate and shows you there's freedom in there and says you want in, you do have to walk in with him. I'll give you that much as your participation. <laughs> okay, and so we come to it. I want you to go to um, the other question. We're going to start at John 6 and verse 4. Okay, and if we're not changing subject, this other question is right in with what I believe that we're supposed to hear this morning. This was out of last week's message, and it's Jesus um, interacting with Philip. Okay, and it says, Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Verse 6, but this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Okay, we explored the word test, okay? And we showed that this word is used throughout Scripture, and this word test means to prove like gold or to bring, bring up, okay? It also means to entice, to tempt, to, um, to draw into, Okay, and Jesus is doing this because he's inviting him not to sit at the gate, but to live in a big, wide kingdom, <laughs> one where Jesus is believed with a violent faith, one where the goodness of God is believed with a passion and a force and a violence. That's the test. But now we're going to get this really straight because this word is used other places. And the question that came to me this week was, are you aware? I was saying, Jesus tempts us into this big, wide kingdom. That's the, that's the meaning of this word. And the question comes, are you aware of the scripture where it says God cannot be tempted and he does not tempt? And it's so important. It's leading us to the perfect place to receive the kingdom invitation. There's a warfare here, and we've got to see what's going on. So now I want you to go to James chapter 1. And this, I think this is going to be our, I should never say this, but these will be our last passage. You can hang out there for a while now. James chapter 1 talks about our warfare here. Here it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you, when you fall into various trials. How many of you like that scripture? 
count it all joy. Various trials. Now, I am going to use a lot of the language here. It's so important. I want to tell you what trials means here. This is not the same word as test. This is a different word, and it means solicitation into an experience of evil or adversity. Okay? When you fall into those kinds of trials. I'm going to propose that you can't do that. You notice that's command language. Count it joy. When you fall into various trials. I'm going to propose you can't do that unless you're interpreting life correctly. Does that sound right to you? And I'm also going to propose that this passage is a let's interpret life correctly passage. Okay? So here we go. Verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. What's tested? Faith. It's important to notice that. It's not just any old test. It's specifically a test of faith. Now, I want to tell you about this word testing here. This is a word that means trying as in a court or a trial. By implication, it's actually, it, it has to do with a trustworthiness. So it's testing the trustworthiness of what? Faith. Okay. Now, what I need to tell you is that they would have understood in their culture that this testing comes from, um, in the legal system, okay, comes from an accuser. So it's like a prosecution, all right? So do, do you know some places the enemy of God, your enemy, is called antidikos, which is the, it's an accuser in a legal situation. It's uh, other places the word of God says he is the accuser of the brethren, now, I want you to know something, and we're just going to put this out now. Um, and if you get nothing else, get this, okay? Jesus tests or entices or, um, or tempts toward life. Come on with me. In the courts of heaven, righteousness is what's tested. If you don't believe me, go read the first chapter of Job. Okay, the whole story, God will not enter into a trial or a test over, over where you're wrong, over your crimes. That's how the, our courts work. You know, the, how's it work here? You, you commit a crime, you go to trial. What? So for sentencing, to determine guilt and things like that, the, this person did this. Do you know that's not how the courts of heaven operate? That's really not. Read Job. It's righteousness. God said, look at my servant Job, how he's above reproach. Do you see? And then Job began to go into a season of testing, of which, of which you'll see, and you're going to see in this message, was not delivered by God's hand. You've got to get that. God does not tempt with evil. God does not test or try with adversity or evil. It's not in his character he cannot. It's the enemy's role. You got it? In the courts of heaven, it is righteousness that is proved like gold. The distinction is so big. We're going to get this as we go on. It's righteousness that's tested in the courts of heaven, and it's, the, it's your enemy, the accuser of the brethren, who wants to point out faults and discredit. That's how that works knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Do you know what the word patience means? That's good, endurance, but in, the, in, the, um, in the, the dictionary of the original language, it includes cheerful. It's cheerful endurance. <laughs> yeah, you can't make that up. <laughs> patience. <laughs> it, uh, uh, the testing of your faith produces patience. Uh, uh, cheerful endurance. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you think your enemy wants you to have cheerful endurance? Well, now let me show you what happened. Let me tell you why he doesn't. Verse 4, if we read on, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I looked up those words, and those words mean perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I'm serious. <laughs> That's what those words mean. How many of you want to lack nothing? <laughs> Amen. Do you know that, that God wants that too? Just like you would for your son or daughter. You want them to grow up perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And God is a way better father than any of us. 
Now watch this. Verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now this sounds like a how-to verse. If I lack, ask God and he'll give it to me. Now I'll give it to you. That It is a how-to verse, but I want to tell you something. This is actually a condition of the heart verse. Um, this is a humility verse. Do you know that? Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I spend a lot of my life, I actually think it's human, ma- human nature, so maybe I do know about you. We have a really strong built-in, I do it myself. <laughs> right? I do it myself. You can hear the two-year-old inside. I got this. This is a humility verse in the midst of a warfare scripture about the adversity and trial. What is it? The solicitation into an experience of evil and and adversity. In that atmosphere, this says some very important things. If you lack wisdom, in other words, if you lack what you need in this adversity, have condition of heart to where you know what to do about it. You ask God. I ask my father. I've got a good father. I recognize I lack what I need here. I've got a good father. Now watch what it says about your good father. If if you ask in that heart, he gives liberally or freely and without without reproach. Do you know we think that... um, Actually, let me do this. Do you know when you ask him for what you need in adversity, if you hear the voice of reproach, in other words, you're going and you're going, oh, I know I should be doing better in my life right now, and this trial is getting the best of me, and you're feeling beat down, there's only two places that that voice within you can be coming from. Do you know what they are? The enemy, and you got it. The enemy, and not only that, we don't even need the enemy to do it. We're pretty good at doing it to ourselves. But there's a truth here that we can take to the bank about our Father, okay? This says our Father will give without reproach. It's a certain condition of heart that will go ask the Father for what you need in the adversity. And in such a way like this, gather this to verse 6, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Do you notice that's the definition of untrustworthiness of faith? So we are still having the same conversation. We are talking about an atmosphere of warfare where there is an accuser who who wants to put on trial your trustworthiness of faith. But God is only interesting. Your good father is only interested in, um, in your righteousness. He's sitting up there like a proud papa going, go, going uh, just like with Job. Look at my son. Look at my daughter. <laughs> they are righteous. Look at the faith in that one. Stories as old as Job. I'm supposed to go to. I should tell you this too, actually. No, let's save that for later. Okay, let's keep moving here. I want to show you some things quickly, and we're going to have the Lord's Supper. I want to go to verse um, 12. Okay, it's a small skip. Here it says, blessed is the man who endures temptation. This is that same word, solicitation or provocation to evil or adversity. We've got to get straight who, who does this. Now watch this. For when he has been approved, that's you, when you're approved in adversity, in this court case going on about you, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, it's getting easier if we interpret life correctly. It's getting a little easier to swallow that we're to take the adversity. um, What does it say? Um, Consider it joy when you find yourself in all kinds of adversity like this. It's winning the crown of life is what this just said. But but go on with me. It says, um, 
Receive the coin of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Verse 13, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Now, that's in, in the original language, that's, that's like an equal sentence structure. In other words, you could read it like this. Um, let no one say he is tempted. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. And then you could read like this. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone by evil. Okay? He is not a tempter of evil. That is, that is the enemy. Now listen to me. What does it mean? Now this sounds like, well, of course I knew that. But <laughs> let this hit home, church, okay? The first thing this verse said is let, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. How do we say I'm tempted by God? I'm going to tell you something. I believe we've gotten into a culture, and you can just open your eyes and look with me. You can see it. And I'm talking about a Christian culture that ascribes a lot of evil to God. <laughs> that is saying I'm tempted by God. You've heard it. God's given you this sickness so that he can build humility in you. The word of God says he cannot. His character will not allow him. God cannot be tempted. He does not use evil as a tool. Evil is from hell, and he died on the cross to bring victory to it. We are never to agree with sickness or death or bondage. God does not. We write it off all the time. Oh, well, you've gotten fired from your job because he wanted to, to build wisdom into your life. No, he didn't. <laughs> the word of God says that, that that evil is not God's. Now, it tells us he is the God who brings good out of all, out of everything. Out of how many things? Everything. Because there's no contest. The victory is. But God does not bring about the evil or the adversity. We are to fight it tooth and nail, and this scripture is telling us how. I want you to continue with me to verse 14, and we'll, and we'll wrap this to, toward the Lord's Supper. But It says, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Do you see that this entire passage is about a particular type of temptation? It is, a, it is the temptation of our enemy. It is, you know, you're tempted by all kinds of things, and there is no neutral. You're enticed by God, and you're enticed by the kingdom of this world. There's no in-between. There's no neutral. The sooner we get that. Do you know what this word means? i got to do this. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. That word enticed actually means entrapped or deluded. By what? What was the door that allowed it to happen? My own desires, okay? Not God. He doesn't get the rap <laughs> on that. Verse 15, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. You got it? There's only one epic battle going on, and it's the battle between a continuous draw to death and a continuous draw to life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He only entices that way. He is not the creator of adversity. He is not the creator of sickness or virus. And I'll finish this passage. Verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. You see, that's how it followed up. Don't be deceived. Interpret correctly. You got it? You've got to interpret life correctly. Don't be deceived. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow or turning. That's your Father. There's only one thing that comes from His hand. Gifts. <laughs> mm. Now here's the best news of all. Okay. Okay. Verse 18, of his own will, speaking of God, 
I'm going, oh, thank God. It doesn't, it doesn't require my will in this case. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. So even the gate, even the receiving, even the entry, I get no credit. <laughs> it is by Jesus. That's why it's narrow. Okay? It's by his own will. He brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now that's beginning to talk about the big wide place. First fruits. We've just first through the gate where I can kind of I can kind of spread my arms we can begin to walk. <laughs> into all the good that he's put out there that you're going to spend eternity getting to the bottom of how good, how many callings, how many destinies, how many joyful things of, that are full of capital L life that are laid up for those who love him. It's a big wide place. This is just the first fruits. Can you imagine? How many of you have been doing great and awesome things with him? Lately, this year, even in the midst of all this adversity, it's just the first fruits. <laughs> You've not even begun yet. It's just the first fruits of a huge, free, grace filled place. Okay, so what are we talking about all morning? And really, this is it as we go to the table. Um, you know, I got to say, First of all, in this court case, we've just got to say this. You know, there's a lot of nepotism going on there. <laughs> Can you imagine what it must make the enemy feel like? We're talking about this whole thing going on that the testing of your faith produces, um, what was it, joyful endurance? cheerful, cheerful endurance so that you can be complete and perfect and lacking nothing. That's all that can result from it. Um, and in the meantime, the judge of the case is, you know, is the Trinity, is your father, okay? And the enemy's got to go, be going, you got to be kidding me. We're going to try your son or we're going to try your daughter. You're the judge and you already told them what the outcome is. It's got to be very frustrating. You know, I can understand why he is so frustrated and angry. <laughs> There's no contest, okay? Um, and to interpret our lives correctly, here's what we're talking about. Because we talked about adversity here. We're talking about the trial, the challenge, the adversity, and the invitation to be in victory in the adversity. So what's that mean? It means um, the enemy is going, if I could just get you to say God's responsible for this evil. You got it? If I could just get you, let me see what I, I wrote here, that God's tempted me into this. Well, God only tempts toward life. So he didn't tempt me into this adversity, okay? He didn't create this. He's not tempting me to the sin, which is really what the James passage is talking about directly. He's not, God doesn't do that. And the enemy's going, if I could just get you to, to believe this, if I could just get you to interpret wrongly, and it is, it is our privilege to go, nope, my father's good. No matter what's going on, no matter what loss I sustain this year, or what illness that I know he's going to heal me of, whether it was those of you who got healed this morning or whether, whether it's going to be done in, in the finality of all things when Jesus returns and makes everything perfect or it's a process of healing. Nope, my father's good. And the enemy's got to be going in frustration. Just conclude that he did this. Just curse him. You know the story of Job. Nope, you did this. God cannot, right? What is it? I praise him still. That's the bottom line. The, the testing of the trustworthiness of faith is not some manifestation. It's a people that are so violently advancing the kingdom in their faith. They're violently advancing that I praise him still. My father's good. You can't convince me otherwise. I praise him still. It releases the kingdom of God like I think nothing else. And the enemy's going, just conclude your situation is hopeless. Nope. Jesus wins. I read the spoiler. I praise him still. I will witness to his goodness. Period. 
You can't make me stop. See, even as I say that, I, look, I'm, <laughs> I struggle myself. Even as those words come out of my mouth, I'm like, I have this feeling like, oh, I'm picking a fight. <laughs> Be careful, right? But you know what? We are picking a fight. It's the lie in our head that there's some contest going on. So as we go to the table today, um, and the worship team could come on up. Uh, I'm about to wrap this. Um, as we go to the table today, you know, what's on my heart is what we declare when we do this. We are declaring that the contest is over and I'm in. That's what this table is. It's the table of complete grace where the blood of Christ covers us. Do you know part of what we think, I guess I have one more I have to do, um, when we approach God so often, and I know this because um, I'm a recovering addict of this, okay? <clears throat> Let's say this well. When we go to God, we tend to bring our past with us, okay? And usually, since we, if you're anything like me, there's a lot more failure than success. There's a lot more dishonoring God than there is honoring God, especially the further you go back in my past. Do you follow? And what we do is we, we bring that past. And I want to tell you what, this court, what the courts of heaven look like. We bring that past, and, and you have an accuser there. We've been talking about it this morning. The accuser is right there, waiting for what you're going to bring to your father. You follow so far? Okay, but this is how this goes. We bring our past, we bring our mistake, we bring our failure, we bring our shortcoming, and, and the father is sitting there like, I'm confused. You follow? I don't know what we're talking about. You see, the word of God is telling the truth when it says that he says, I remember your sin no more. You see, that happened at the gate. And when we keep dragging this stuff up into the courts of heaven, he doesn't try crimes. He tried crimes with Jesus, and, and that was finished at the victory that this table's about. It's done with Jesus. And when you enter the gate and receive the kingdom, he remembers no more. And when you keep, keep bringing that stuff back into the courts of heaven, it just leaves God talking about a subject he doesn't know anything about. He says, I look at you, I see the blood of Christ. I see perfect righteousness. In my courts, we only try righteousness. We only put righteousness on trial because I don't see anything else for anyone else who's entered through the gates. Does that make sense? That is what we declare at this table. You can only see yourself the way God sees you or you're bringing a conversation into the courts of heaven that he doesn't even know how to have. Amen? Amen. <laughs> That's what we declare at this table. If I can...